Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence webinar, Culture Mapping, Creating a Culture of Resilience and Long-Term Success. Before we get started today, I want to take a moment and recognize members of the Mac Baldridge Society who serve as the trustees for the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. It is their generous support that makes presentations like today possible. And here's today's agenda. Our guest presenters are Travis Slosier, Chief Culture and Quality Officer at Jordan Johnson Incorporated, and Juan Maroni Omatad, Vice President of Organizational Excellence, Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, and she is also a current Baldridge Executive Fellow. Following their presentation and their question and answer period, we'll have a few closing remarks. And now I'm going to turn it over to Travis to get us started. Thank you, Al, and thank you to the Baldridge Foundation for this opportunity for Juan and I to present what I think you all will find extremely valuable in this new tool called Culture Mapping. Um, it, it's a tool that really focuses on helping you understand your organization's culture. So I'll kick off the presentation, introduce the concept, but you're going to get a lot of value from Juan's presentation around how Methodist Healthcare Ministries have applied this and continue to apply culture mapping to drive long-term success and results. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If I were to ask you to pause just for a couple seconds here and think about how much time does your organization spend on strategic planning, strategic development? Would you measure that time in hours? Would you measure that time in days? Let me ask you a different question around culture. How much time does your organization spend intentionally understanding the current culture, the desired culture of your organization? My guess is there's a big delta between the amount of time your organization's spending on strategy versus culture. And this tool around culture road mapping and culture mapping is a tool that helps you very intentionally design your organization's culture. I think one of the biggest myths around culture is that culture just organically kind of evolves over time. And this concept of culture mapping challenges that status quo. So on this next slide, this graphic says you could change culture in one day. We're going to do it on the 10th. <laughs> we all know that you can't change culture in one day. This takes years and years of work. And I think you'll hear in Juan's case study that the, the work of culture change never stops. You know, you have to continuously be evolving. Um, your organization's got to be resilient. It's got to be ready for change. It's got to be adaptive and agile. And we'll showcase how culture mapping can help you with that. And our definition of culture is the collection of behaviors of people in an organization. So how do you take sometimes hundreds of thousands of people in an organization and create a great company culture that that takes time and and Juan will even talk a little bit about the case study around you know you may even have subcultures in an organization where one specific team displays different attributes than another team so how do you start to use a tool like culture mapping to very intentionally um, shape the vision for the desired future state of your culture so in our presentation we'll introduce the concept of culture mapping my hope is that you'll see the, the template and the tool and not be intimidated. It's very straightforward. The biggest challenge for organizations is finding the time to intentionally do this work. It starts with the executive leadership team. So you very intentionally need to do this work and find time um, to intentionally focus on your culture. We'll share a case study, a very good case study that Juan will talk about through Methodist Healthcare Ministries. And our hope is that you can take some elements of today's presentation, maybe even the tool, and start to intentionally design your desired culture within your organization. So what is culture mapping? You think about organizational culture, and it's all of this. It's your workplace. It's your organizational values. It's your leadership. It's technology. It's tools and systems. And every organization is unique. And leaders very intentionally build culture. And, you know, you could do that 
just kind of unintentionally by exhibiting certain behaviors and actions throughout the organization or as leaders, we can role model the behaviors and action that we'd like to see across the organization that ultimately creates our culture. This third bullet point, I think, is very, very interesting given the time um, that we're in around mass adoption of technology. You know, industry 4.0 is moving full steam ahead. It's hard not to open a web browser today and not see something about artificial intelligence. So I do think we have to challenge ourselves to think about culture no longer being the soft stuff and shifting that mindset to saying, this is the really hard work that we have to do as leaders to help shape the vision for what our organizational cultures need to look like to thrive now and into the future. Because with the, the accelerated adoption of some of this technology, I believe that organizations that are resilient and are able to quickly adapt and adopt change will be the organizations that ultimately um, find themselves experience long-term success. So all of that being said, culture mapping is a tool to help us do that work. It helps us intentionally build the culture um, that we desire. So on these next few slides, I just want you to reflect and think about, are you experiencing some of these things within your organization today? So these next two slides come from Brene, Brene Brown um, in her book called Dare to Lead. So are you experiencing this challenge around avoiding tough conversations that our culture is very nice, you know, we're very polite and we use that sometimes to avoid these tough conversations. Are we experiencing like this fourth bullet point here? Some of our team members are not taking intelligent or smart risk. We're avoiding some of those um, bold ideas or innovations that may help our organization advance to the next level of maturity or the next step, whatever that looks like. Are we, you know, do we have a blame and shame kind of culture where we're, you know, blaming process related issues on people? Are we, you know, not spending enough time adequately understanding problems and we're addressing symptoms like this eight, eighth bullet point, you know, calls out. So as you're looking through some of these issues and if you can connect, you know, we're seeing a little bit of this in our, you know, culture today, culture mapping may be a very good tool for you all to consider using. On this next slide, this slide talks about low trust teams and high trust teams. So if you think about this being a spectrum from low to high, and you see things like conceal their weaknesses and mistakes from one another, that's a low trust team compared to a high trust team where we're admitting weaknesses and we're admitting you know, we've made a mistake. Is our culture holding grudges? Or are we taking risk and offering feedback for assistance? So as you read through this list, and think about some of those 10 common behaviors listed in Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. Are you experiencing some of these things in your cultures today? And if you are, culture mapping is a tool that can help you articulate and visualize your culture, um, something that's sometimes ambiguous. It's you know hard to wrap your arms around what's culture really mean. And this tool helps make that work very visible. So just do some self-reflection on those previous three, three slides. This next slide just highlights some organizations that are known for its culture. And I love this quote from the CEO of Costco. Culture isn't the most important thing. Culture is the only thing. So all of you, if you had time to reflect, you could probably place you know, your own brand up here, you know, Starbucks. Um, and I'll share a brief story, uh, a personal story from, from last year. My family experienced some of the air traffic issues last year over the holiday. Um, we took a family trip to Arizona and our flight was scheduled to leave the day before things, uh, before Christmas Eve. And we got the dreaded notification that our flight was canceled, which meant that our seven-year-old, 10-year-old um, and 14-year-old was not gonna be home for Christmas. So as soon as we got the notification, I called the Marriott that we were staying and asked if they had availability. They said, yes, come on back. By the time we got back to the Marriott that we stayed, they'd already checked us into the room 
And one of the associates slid me a note and said, does your family do Elf on the Shelf? And Alyssa, my wife and I looked at each other and kind of puzzled. We'd had a long day at the airport and we circled yes. It was like a note you were passing in the class. We circled yes. We went out to the car, got our luggage. And by the time we got up to our room, right there on the table was an elf on the shelf. And that meant so much to our seven and 10 year old that kind of turned our day around and said, we're gonna make the best of this. The next day we left a different associate, made small talk with my wife and I about what our kids interested in. We didn't think anything of it. And then the next day, our earliest we could get a flight out was on Christmas Day. And as we're leaving for the earliest flight we could get out, a different associate was working the desk. And they said, before you all leave, Lozier family, check under the Christmas tree in the lobby. And our kids ran over to the Christmas tree and they purchased presents for them. I still get emotional telling the story because I remember how much it meant to our family at that time. And they made this, you know, experience where we were dreading not being home for Christmas. They created that for our kids in the lobby, which was very special. So I wrote a note to Marriott and come to find out they very intentionally trained their associates in this particular Marriott group that's managed around customer service and going above and beyond. They have systems and structures in place that they have a specific budget for these things. So they had you know, funds available for them to create this type of experience. And ultimately in the letter I received back, they said, this is our culture. And from that experience, I'm forever a Marriott fan. And I've told this story probably a hundred times since that experience, but those are the types of you know, systems and structures and training that you can very intentionally design within your organizations. And you all probably have very similar stories um, to that, that you can tie directly back to an organization's culture. So here's culture mapping, and I'll talk a little bit about the details of actually completing a culture map. And then Juan's going to give you a lot more context around how to use this from an organizational perspective. So the culture mapping starts ideally with your executives and your executive teams. And we start with a simple, what we call a card sorting. So we give the executive team a bundle of words that describe a culture potentially. And this exercise is very interesting when you see, you know, a group of leaders trying to come to consensus on, you know, what words best describe our culture. Even in this first bullet point, you start to detect some variation around, you know, I, I believe we have this type of culture. I believe we have this type of culture. And it starts to build consensus amongst your leadership team, just doing the simple cards, card sorting exercise. Once that's complete, we start to build out what's called the current state culture roadmap. And I'll show you an example here of what this looks like. So this is the common template here. And on the top banner, we ask what type of results are we currently getting? Are we, are we achieving the results that we would expect to see given our industry, given, you know, given our performance levels? You know, where are we with the results? What are some of the observable behaviors that we're seeing within the organization? So it gives them a time and place to articulate those observable behaviors. And then what currently exists in the organization that's accelerating our current culture and what's decelerating us from achieving what we need to achieve. So it's a very simple four part template that you walk through with your teams and the power of this template is it helps really visualize and put on paper your culture, which sometimes is very ambiguous and hard to quantify. So let me talk through the next steps of this. So once you work through the template, your team is agreeing, agreeing upon the results. You know, ideally you have really strong measurement systems in place and you're pulling the results from your score, you know, scorecards and your dashboards then you're having really good discussions around what are some of the observable behaviors that we're experiencing and seeing within the organizational organization today. Accelerators, what could accelerate us to have a positive culture? What are the things getting in the way 
of us having a healthy culture. And when Juan shares her case study, I think you'll see some of this come to life in her example. So this is an example of what one looks like. So it is very heavy. There's a lot of content on here, but it really does a nice job of articulating your current culture. And it does take time to work with your leadership team to just, you know, identify that time to do this very intentional work. Once you spend that time, then we recommend converting that roadmap into a graphic depiction of your current state. So um, this is one, Jane Pope is a role model leader, um, and she was one of the first early adopters of culture mapping. And this is what an example of the visual depiction looks like. And Juan's got an example that, that she'll share. Um, and once you have this visual depiction, you know, place this in conference room, place it anywhere in your organization to make it very visual for your organization. So this was a hand-drawn example. This is one from a, a graphic designer on our team. Her name's Kendall. She's extremely talented and did all of this on the computer, but you can see it still has this look and graphical feel um, that really articulates, you know, the culture state, the, the culture map. Um, so the last segment here before I hand over to Juan is why is this important? And I think now, you know, more than ever, you know, understanding your culture can help us, you know, lead organizations to produce better and ultimately long-term results. I'm sure some of you are familiar with these types of studies. We're seeing them more and more often now. Um, this study from Deloitte says, it's, you know, anywhere from 60 to 70% of change initiatives fail to meet desired outcomes. And it's not always because of the technical solution. It's most likely attributed to um, not understanding the organizational culture or the human side of change. Culture mapping can help us as leaders understand the current culture, address the soft stuff, understand what are those things that get in the way of our change initiatives. And then ultimately, this can help us build resilient organizations, just this culture mapping tool. So how, how does it do that? And there's a lot of factors in um, resiliency, but your ability and the organization's ability to withstand and adapt quickly to disruptions and challenges ultimately will be a key success factor for any organization and in any industry. And resilience encompasses a lot. It encompasses risk management, business continuity, leadership and governance, employee well-being. There's a lot of factors in resilience. And culture mapping can help us just by talking about those specific values, beliefs, and behaviors. And just by making that visual for your organization, then you can develop action plans to help you accelerate your accelerators, do more of the things that are helping you. You could address your decelerators and mitigate the risk associated with those decelerators, ultimately helping you achieve some of those high-level results that your organization's aspiring for. So that was a very quick overview of the concept of culture mapping and understanding the concept, understanding the tool, challenging you a little bit to think about how much time you're spending intentionally focusing on culture. And I'm gonna turn this over now um, and let Juan bring this to life and share a great case study around how Methodist Healthcare Ministries is using culture mapping. Um, in fact, one, I think it started during the pandemic and I know you all are still using this today um, to change the culture of your organization. So Juan, why don't you take it away? All right, thanks Travis. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so let me just give a quick background about MHM because I think it, it goes to um, just some of the challenges that we have when we talk about change. So we are a faith-based organization our work, um, we do clinical care, but we also do community health and wellness care. So we have um, community health and wellness programs. So we have a broad portfolio of programming that we do. Um, and at the time that we implemented culture mapping, our organization was 26 years old. We just turned 26 and I had been here 
for 21 of those years. And so I recognize that um, there would be some value in really having some conversations about culture. Um, there were also a couple of other key things that were happening. For one, as Travis mentioned, this we did this really smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. So um, in late 2019, our board of directors had adopted what we were calling our Vision 2020 strategy. It was our new organizational strategy that had come out of our strategic planning um, in the year or so leading up to that. Um, and we were set to implement that starting in 2020. Well, of course, you know, life happens. And then we all found ourselves um, in a worldwide pandemic. <clears throat> and so then coming out in 2021, the, the re-entry back to trying to get back to normal, we knew we needed to get back to implementing our strategy, but there were also, um, we hadn't had a chance really to shop the strategy, but then just trying to work through change um, still in the middle of a global pandemic. And so in order to effectively drive the strategy, our new strategy forward, um, but also at the same time, we had decided that we wanted to adopt the Baldrige Excellence Framework to really focus on continuous improvement and hardwiring um, some of the things that we knew we were doing well. So that was a lot of change happening at one time. And again, still trying to manage life um, in a pandemic. We still had team members working at home. Others of us had come back into the workplace. So there was a lot happening at one time. And so we had talked about doing the culture map. Um, the other piece related to that, and, and I talked about how old we were, um, is because we do have a lot of team members like myself who've been here for a very long time. And we have a workforce that is very, very committed to our mission of serving humanity to honor God. But as we moved into a space where we were wanting to focus on performance and measurement, but then also drive this strategy forward um, in ways that we had previously, um, that was going to be a challenge for us because it was in some ways, you know, contrary to just driving everything with the mission focus. We weren't losing the focus on our mission, but we were wanting to incorporate some tools like performance measurement to help us to be more effective and more impactful. And that for some people ran contrary to their experience. Um, as we got to the culture map and you'll have a chance to see ours, um, one of the things that was evident is um, that there were some, the things, many of the things that appeared on there, especially as the decelerators were things that we already knew um, existed. The challenge is it was hard to address some of those because they weren't, um, it wasn't anywhere. Um, and even the good stuff, right? We hadn't had a chance to really validate the things that we were doing well, um, but then to air out the dirty laundry on the things that were decelerating us from being able to do what we wanted to do. But once we had the map, it was there, it was you know, in ink, and then everybody had access to it. And so it really called us to um, accountability around the things that we we're wanting to do to help move our organizational culture forward. So the way that we implemented it um, is we, and here you'll see CEOC and it's interchangeable here with senior leaders. So our CEOC is our CEO's council. And that is um, our senior leadership team that's comprised of our officers and then our vice presidents. And then um, a, a, we have a few directors that also report directly to our CEO. So it's basically everyone in our CEO's cabinet, our senior leadership team. So we went through the exercise that Travis described where we worked through the card sort and talked about what we thought our current culture was. And we actually um, completed the roadmap with our current state. And like the others, you can see it's very dense. There's a lot of information here that we needed to work through. Um, our, our next step was to talk about, well, what is our desired state? Where is it that we're wanting to go, right? So as a map, it's helping to guide us. We talked about where we were uh, or where we are, and then where is it that we wanna go? Because that's what's gonna help us to make um, determination about what we need to do to get where we want to go. So we have these um, documents that we refer back to um, as part of the development of that culture map. After that, we then went to um, our full um, grouping of leaders, um, which we meet quarter on a quarterly basis at what we call our leadership excellence session. 
And that is our senior leadership team, along with our frontline supervisors, our managers, and our directors. And so we brought the um, current and desired state roadmap documents to our full leadership team for the organization. And we spent some time, and again, this was in the pandemic, so we were doing all of this on Zoom. Um, so we spent some time in that quarterly session working through um, what the senior leaders had defined as some of our, of our current state, and then also working through our desired state piece. And so we did large group work, but then we also um, had some support in moving folks into virtual rooms to do small, small group work um, in mixed groups, and then to come back and report out to the larger group. So our full leadership team um, across all areas of the organization had an opportunity to provide um, input and suggestions for refinement into uh, the culture map document. So here's our next iteration of that coming out of um, that those meetings. And as Travis said, you know, we talked about accelerators and decelerators, and you know, those are key. The accelerators, you know, in some ways, um, they're not completely aspirational, but it's that's that's part of what is it that we what's going to help us to get to where we want to go. And then the decelerators, you know, are what's slowing us down, what's what's making us stay stuck, what's helping, what's preventing us from progressing um, in the things that we want to do. So after that, I spent some time um, working with the Jordan Johnson team and a graphic artist um, that 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 they work with. And this is the product of that. We had a couple of iterations of the culture map. You know, we we tweaked it. And so I'll just spend a few minutes here, kind of walking through it, um, just to give you a sense because it can be it's it can be overwhelming when you first look at it because the page is very busy. There's a lot of information there, but there is a structure to it. So down here at the very bottom, you see our current state, and <clears throat> the key things that we identified, and you could see from the roadmap graphic or or format there's a lot of information there we obviously can't get it all onto the culture map but we went through and for the highlight i think some of the key things that help to um uh point to key items there's other information there where we could we synthesize things you know summarize bullet points but we we have those documents along with the culture map working together so our current state we said we were siloed bureaucratic there's a lot of reactivity and impulsivity happening um, and that there was a lot of competition, unhealthy kinds of competition, and there was a lack of trust. Um, and, and of course, we're talking about organization, but this is the perspective from our leaders. Um, we also talked about the fact that we're unique as a strength. Um, we have a spiritual foundation. We're a faith-based organization. And we're very mission-driven. You heard me mention that earlier. And so the reason why those three things landed on the steps is because they are things that we wanna take forward. We wanna leave the silo, bureaucratic, reactive, impulsive, competitive, lack of trust stuff behind. But as we embark and get onto this bridge, there are some things we do wanna take forward. So it's recognizing that everything's not bad. There are good things um, that are already happening in a part of the culture. We want to um, continue those and um, expand on those, but there's some things that we really do wanna leave behind. And so we put, um, under the bridge, you'll see our decelerators that are listed there. And these really are things that slow us down. There's always been a lot of talk around, there's too many competing priorities, things are changing. We get going down one path, something else happens. Um, leadership's not always on the same page. It's, it, things are chaotic sometimes. Um, you know, goals aren't consistent. Goals aren't necessarily working, you know, in concert to move us forward. So. Lots of things that are here, lack of psychological safety, that's a big one. You know, if you don't have that, then you really don't have anything that you're going to be able to, to do. And then on the bridge is our accelerators, right? These are things that are going to help to bridge us and move us forward. And so we talked about the importance of um, shared leadership and having a focused strategy that everyone owns and is, is um, vested in and can move forward. Role model leadership, how do we build trust? How do we engage our team members? How do we develop capacity and capabilities across our organization? So you can see these accelerators and some of them speak very directly to the decelerators, um, but it, it's not always, doesn't have to necessarily be a bullet for a bullet there. Um, and then in the future, um, our future state is 
you know, when we look at these stars and swags here, you know, we want to continue to embrace our mission, vision, and cultures. We want to build strong community relationships. We need to create more trusted relationships within the organization. Um, and then we want to advance our mission and vision through organizational excellence, the concept, right? And that's why we talked about um, and decided we wanted to adopt the Baldridge framework because um, we know we're doing some good things out there in our community. We just want to be able to get better at getting better. And then how do we have a maximum impact for all of the things that we're doing? And then for us, we want to be sure that our mission, vision, and values continue to guide everything that we do. And so they are there prominently displayed as part of our culture map and continue to serve as the cornerstone and the foundation for the work that we're doing. And so this, we, we did our first quarter leadership um, session. So this was kind of January, February, March timeframe. We did the road mapping and that work. And then by the time we got to this place, after sorting through all of the information and then working with the visual artists, it's probably about May. We had already come into the spring by the time we got to this, this final version here. And so after that, what I did was I went on um, sort of a organizational tour, packed up a little dog and pony show and went out and literally met with every um, team across our organization. And so just to give you um, a sense of how we're organized, we are based in San Antonio, Texas, which is here in Bear County. Um, our corporate office is here. The majority of our um, 500 team member workforce is here in the Bear County and surrounding area. But we do have team members in some of these um, more remote and distant areas. And so when we talk about culture and subculture, there is an organizational culture. And then within all of these teams and in some of these folks, some of these team members work by themselves or they work, um, they're housed in um, a Methodist church or in a regional office. So there's different cultures there, but even within our building, right? Our corporate office has third floors, three floors. If you engage with each of the different work teams, you'll find that there are elements of culture even within those teams that varies. Um, you go to different locations, there are subcultures at each location. So imagine we've got folks all over South Texas here, um, some of whom are by themselves, others who may be working in small groups, and then those of us who come to work in an office where there's 100 people or 200 people. So I took the time across the summer and into the fall and scheduled meetings with every organizational leader and their department team. So I took the culture map out to every team member in the organization and spent time walking through it in a bit more detail than like what I just did with you all, but spent time walk, working through that, talking about culture um, and why that's important, especially as we are um, working to advance our new organizational strategy. And so for me, what was, um, I'll say pleasantly surprising is that team members immediately took to it and, you know, they're saying, well, do you have a copy of that that I can put in my cubicle or I want to put it on my desk or I want to have it here or can I make a screensaver out of it? And that was important because, you know, culture, everybody owns culture, right? In my role as vice president of organizational excellence, that is one of the areas that I'm helping to drive in terms of our cultural transformation. And I like to say I'm the keeper of the map, but I don't own the culture. Right. I keep the map and make sure, you know, we're doing the things that we need to do with it. But I don't own the culture. I can't change the culture by myself. We all collectively um, form the culture. We all collectively own the culture and we all collectively have to change the culture. Um, and so as I went out to talk to the different teams, I was very heartened that team members did take that to heart. Um, and saw value in that. At the same time, some of them were saying like, as I was reviewing the current state, they're like, well, I haven't experienced that. Like, I don't, what do you mean by, you know, bureaucracy or what do you mean by impulsivity? So again, you can see that in different perspectives of the organization, some people may say, yeah, that's right on. I've experienced that. And other people would say, well, I haven't experienced that, not in the team where I work. So it's also important to, to keep in mind that there's, you know, that, that difference in cultures and subcultures as well. So then at the same time that I was out um, 
doing my shop around. And some of those meetings, I don't know if I said were via Zoom, others were in person, you know, as we were able to come together. Um, we then created, we were at the simultaneously, the senior leadership team created a list of action items because you have to have action. Um, where is my list of action items? Oh, it's on the next one. So when we talk about action planning, you know, you do, these are some things to keep in mind. First of all, I'm going to say intentionality is everything. And that was really my um, kind of motto or theme coming into this role. I previously led, you know, clinical operations and moved over to help drive culture and some other transformational things. And so I talked a lot about intentionality, um, you know, we know we're doing some good things. We need to be intentional about documenting and sharing those best practices. We know there are some things that we need to um, uh, adjust and change. We need to be intentional about making those adjustments. And so the culture map in a lot of ways helped us with our intentionality by helping us to call things out, um, label them, be able to point to them and then tie direct actions to those. So, um, you know, it, here's some some tips and you'll have these once you get the the information post recording um post session but it's it's really as we walk through this process it's really like brainstorming everybody has ideas we want everyone's ideas and um voice to be heard um and then there's opportunities to then condense that down to make it digestible and so even once you get to the map, there's additional work that has to be done around developing um, your action plan. And it doesn't have to be perfect, right? You can't, you're not gonna have a solution for everything, but you keep the map out in front of you and you continue to go back to it and do work, add things, take things off, check things off. Um, and But you've got to actually do something with it. And so here's an example. Um, we got a lot of <laughs> dense checklists and things, but there's a lot of work to be done, right? So we put together um, some of our action planning brainstorming, and then you can see here that we um, kind of prioritized a few things and then identified owners or a process. So here we said we're going to do this, and we're going to have a um, rapid improvement event in the second quarter. These things, Juan's going to be responsible for doing that. We'll talk to our HR VP. So we identified action plans, then we also made someone responsible for them. Because I think everyone's had the experience where you get a whole list of action, and then you look back 30 days, 60 days, and not all the action, no, no movements happen because you haven't fully assigned that to that area of responsibility. So we have been working intentionally to assign um, responsibility for the actions that we've Developed. And so again, these are living, breathing documents. They adjust and change as we check things off. This is, um, these are some of the examples of things that we developed organizationally as a result of um, our work related to our culture map. Um, we've developed, when we talk about misaligned goals, dis disjointed goals, um, this is our third year of implementing um, a goal. Um, a, a learning process and a um, coordinated process for developing and cascading organizational goals all the way to the front line. And then we've developed virtual goal alignment boards in um, the SPEAK system that the Jordan Johnson team um, has helped us with so that every team member can see um, the goals for every department in the organization and how those align across the organization and up to our organizational strategy. Um, so that's one example. We actually have physical goal alignment boards that are posted. Like I have one right outside my office, like so stand there and have a conversation with you about my department's goals. But then these, because we have team members who aren't um, here locally and are working out in the region, we have the alignment boards. So anybody um, can, can get on and see what everyone in the organization is doing. And transparency has been a big part of our culture shift over the past couple of years. We developed a leadership system. You see, we have our organizational excellence framework. Um, so again, just an example of some of the things that have grown out of our work um, that started with our culture map. And we continue to really go back and double check and say, okay, what have we done um, on these accelerators, right? We talked about building capacity, what have we done? So we will periodically go and look on our culture map 
at accelerators, look at the decelerators. Have we made progress in helping to decrease the impact of these decelerators in our organization? So it's something that you keep out front. If you were to come and visit us and you walk around, you go into our conference rooms, our meeting spaces, you will see our culture map on the wall, along with our mission, vision, values, our strategy map, um, our leadership system, our culture map um, is there. And I'll be honest, it's one of the things, you know, aside from mission, vision, and core values, I think the culture map is probably one of the other things that our team members consistently recognize and relate to. And we do keep that posted and out front. Again, you know, as we've moved into results, you remember I talked about that being an area where we felt challenged around performance measurement. Um, we've gotten more comfortable with actually charting and measuring a lot of things. Um, and you can see where we've moved into um, top decile performance in a lot of spaces, but that has taken work and really um, focus on helping team members understand as part of our culture, it is important to measure and assess ourselves because that is how we get better at getting better. Um, and so then we are at a place now, um, we actually are doing planning right now. Our culture map has been in place for three years and we have really, we spent some time last December and we made a full list of all the things we've done and we tied them to the culture map um, and um, feel like we've made a lot of progress. And, and I have, I can say you can see and feel the change in the organization. You know, culture is palpable. You can see it, smell it, taste it when you show up in a space. And um, we can see the changes that have happened, have taken place in our organization over the past three years um, as a result of our intentional focus around creating a culture that supports innovation, that, um, that provides psychological safety, that is um, focused on dialogue and open communication, all of those things. Um, and so our Goal and plan for this year, we'll, we'll do some work um, in this first quarter. And again, it takes a few sessions and it, it takes some coordinated work, but we are starting right now on our process for recreating those meetings where we have our senior leadership team, have those conversations where we will bring our whole leadership excellence team together on February 2nd. And then we will get to another place where we've developed um, a new culture map and it's new based off of our current culture, right? So the one that I showed you was based off of kind of that point, um, the point in time in 2021, but it was the culture that we were living in. Now we've done work over the past three years um, and we're going to see what that shows up as and what it looks like on our new culture map. And then we move into the action planning again, based off of what the current state shows up as and what we identify as decelerators and accelerators moving forward. So, um, you know, I don't have a recipe for should it be two years, three years, four years, but for us, the timing was right on this. Um, we um, just we've got quite a few things happening in the organization. The other thing that I'll share is that we were also in, the, in a transition during this time we had um, Recently, um, leading up to the pandemic, we had changes in our really uh, our, in our senior leadership team, and so by the time we got to um, in in the pandemic, we had in the previous three years or so, all of our officers um, had had tra transitioned, and we had a whole new group of officers: our CEO, CFO, and COO. And so those are things that impact the culture as well. So. Um, you know, for us, those folks have been in place. Uh, we've been working around this culture map. You may have a situation where you all do a culture map, something significant happens in the organization, that may be time to go back and do a different culture map after, you know, you settled into that. For us, it's just been three years of really hard work moving forward around process improvement, performance excellence, um, really looking at developing and integrating um, a business plan around diversity, equity, and inclusion, advancing our strategy. There's been a lot of big things that have happened um, that have really um, tied to elements of that culture map. And so for us, we had talked about maybe doing it last year, but we decided this was gonna be the right year for us to do it. And so um, hopefully by, certainly by May, but maybe by the end of the first quarter, we will have 
our new and improved um, for our current state culture map um, and where we want to move forward to in the future. And then we will pretty much adopt the same process where we spend time going over that map with team members, with every department, helping everyone to connect to it, understand what it's saying, and to um, commit to helping us to move forward and um, move our organizational culture to the next level. So a few things um, in this last minute or so here, every culture map is different. So you've seen at least examples of three, you saw ours and then two others that Travis had there. Every culture map is different. And so, you know, there's not one um, particular format you want. You just wanna make sure you highlight your accelerators, decelerators, um, where you're going, where you are, all of those elements off of the roadmap. Um, your leadership team has to be vested in, in what you're doing. Um, and that's from really from the board all the way across your leadership team, because everyone has to be working to drive the change that we've identified needs to be done. And not only committed in that, yeah, I support that. I think that's a great culture map, but committed in the sense that they are actually actively working to help develop and transition to that new culture. Um, it's just, you're not going to make it just by having a map. Everyone, you have to actively be working um, to make some things happen there. So intentionality is the word of the day. Well, Juan and Travis, thank you for such an engaging and outstanding presentation. Boy, there's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of information to unpack there. A number of questions from the audience. And so I'm going to throw the first one out here. Um, first of all, how do you communicate the culture map throughout the organization? Well, I'll share my experience. I mean, for me, it was, I just that rolled up my sleeves and said, let me just go out here and meet with everybody um, and make sure that everyone understands what it means, um, understands it, that they are co-owners of the culture map and um, that every team member has the um, the opportunity and the obligation to help us to drive the organizational culture in a way that allows um, the organization to get better, allows our individual team members to get better and to accomplish the work um, that we've set out. So, um, you know, Travis talked about technology and there's a lot of, you know, possibilities there. For me, it was just kind of the old fashioned, go out and sit down and talk to folks. But then we also keep it out front regularly. So it shows up on our screensavers in the organization. You see it on walls. So keeping it out front and alive and helping people to continue to connect to it is very important. I think Al, you know, I think Juan's example is what I would consider to be a best practice of actually going out and making the rounds um, all over South Texas. But if you're sitting here listening and saying, I don't know how I would do that, given the size of our organization, I would just challenge you to think about what existing communication channels does your executive team have today when they cascade information throughout the organization and start asking yourself, how could we use those same types of channels without necessarily creating a new um, communication channel or doing what Juan did and going, you know, taking this on the road, even though I think um, the insights, Juan, that you gain from those discussions enriched future modifications and you were able to bring things back to the CEOC that I don't think we would have, you know, been able to create that two-way dialogue had you not done that. But I think leverage existing communication channels that you have within your organization to do your best to create those opportunities for engagement and dialogue. That's the only thing I would add, Al. Okay. Uh, our next question here, it's actually a combination of two questions, but the, I'm going to roll it up into one. Um, how often do you review and revise the culture map? Al, I realize that I, I jumped ahead and just started answering questions, right? Because yeah, these things were coming to mind, like, oh, we're going to do it this year. I think it just really depends on the organization. There's not a set formula that says you have to do it once a year might be too much because you also have to take time to, to, to implement some work, right? You don't want to keep revisiting it and coming out with the same thing. You need to give yourself enough time to, to do some things um, because ideally what you want to see for sure is that the current state, um, the negative aspects of that have started to shift and the decelerators have started to shift. If you're doing it too frequently, you may not have had time to effectively address your 
decelerators or some of those negative aspects of the culture. And so you're going to keep getting the same thing over again. So depending on the size of your organization, how much focus you're putting into addressing those decelerators and accelerators, it might be a couple of years. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's more frequent than like a 10 year thing, right? Like it, 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 I think it, there's a few factors that are in there. I think for us, this is going into our fourth year. So we pretty have much had three solid years. Um, much of that first year was developing and shopping it around, but we did immediately start some work on it. So for me right now, having done this the first time out of the gate, the three years feels about right because it's given us some time to actually do some work, some targeted work. Um, next time around, it may be two years. So I, there's not a prescribed answer for that, but I would say one year may be too frequent. Um, but it may also depend on if your organization is where your organization is um, in terms of that current state and what you're really having to do to try and move towards that future state. And Juan, I know you are going through this cycle in year three, um, but I know from helping facilitate some of your annual strategic retreats, that's an agenda item every year to at least revisit the strategy map as a group to just you know, we're not making significant changes to the map, but you all do use that as a key input into your strategic planning process. So you're very intentional in how you use that in a lot of the work that you do, even though you're not refreshing it, you know, every year, you all actually use that as a key part of a lot of your processes from an organization perspective. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our third question is, do you use the culture map during your strategic planning? Well, yes. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, our culture map is everywhere. Um, and we we refer to it constantly, even sometimes in decision making. If we're talking about, well, do we really want to consider, you know, this initiative right now or what is it that we want to do? Um, if it ties to something on the culture map, we'll say, well, look, here's where this directly ties. How can we address that? Is there something else that we're already doing? So it is a regular part of our conversations. Visually, it's in place, you know, where those decisions are being um, made and those conversations are taking place, but it is very much a part of our strategic planning. It's very much a part of our conversations. Um, and our decision making, and not just the leaders. You will have team members that say, "Well, we talked about this on the culture map. You know, how does this tie and connect to that?" So it is a very um, integral piece of um, our work, and 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 we've been very intentional about making it a part of our decision making and our daily our daily organizational culture. Okay. Our our next question is. Uh, what are some of the organizational changes you have made based on your culture mapping? Um, some of the some of the things um, I, I showed, um, you know, we the goal alignment board and um, just even how we cascade goals has been a big piece. We talked a lot. That was one of the areas that came up a lot um, in that initial session was around. Um, disjointed leadership, competing priorities, just so much work, not making progress on work, misaligned goals. Um, and so the I would say one of the major things that's happened is the goal alignment work that we've done, um, not only developing the boards to provide transparency, but putting processes in place to make sure that goals are, are reasonable, that they make sense, that they connect to our strategy. Um, and that we're monitoring those in a way that helps us, that help us to be um, to be effective organizations. It's probably one of the major things that's happened. We've also done a lot of um, capacity building over the past couple of years. We've brought in a variety of training. Travis has done, you know, change leader, change management training. He's done process based management training, um, Six Sigma um, Green green belt training. So really developing capacity for our team members and helping them to have tools that help us move as an organization along our process, our um, performance improvement uh, journey. And then also, you know, leadership and individual development opportunities for our team members as well. Okay. 
Uh, we have another question here talks about employees and it's uh, how are the strengths of the employees used to maximize the impact of culture mapping? Um, well, where we're able to, um, as we're implementing initiatives or identifying um, ways that we want to address um, something that's on the culture map, we are more, um, I think, effective in reaching out to team members. We saw, we've also done as part of that capacity building, um, you know, facilitation training and other things. So that has helped with all of those capacity building trainings, it has allowed us to really go out and um, reach out to team members and help them or ask them to engage in helping us to move change forward. So um, again, where we know we have team members that have certain strengths, we will reach out and ask them to help us to lead in certain initiatives um, or to be a part of particular teams that are developing initiatives to um, promote or address something that's there on the culture map. So um, that is one of the reasons why it is important to get everybody vested in your culture map, because then you have opportunities to um, take advantage of those skills and experiences and strength that those team members have and bring them on board to help to drive that change. And I, I know one, one thing to add to that is you very intentionally during the quarterly performance reviews, you're tracking the number of team members engaged in some of these key organizational projects and activities. And the last number I recall was, it was well over a hundred now of unique team members that have been engaged. And I just think that, you know, a lot of that is, you know, attributed, I think, to some of the culture work that you started back during the pandemic that um, you are seeking out ways to develop your team members and engage them in new ways. So I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think Juan, you've been very intentional, you and the entire organization about internal capacity building and, and change readiness. Um, and being and being more, one more thing, I'll just be more intentional about managing our work effectively because that goes to like the competing priorities, right? If you have the same few people who you put on every work group and then you have work groups that never end, then you have the same few people who are trying to do their day job and sit on these perpetual work groups that never end and aren't making any progress, right? So we've really developed a, a solid model around short-term action teams. They're 90-day teams. And if the work is larger than 90 days, we phase it so that you can accomplish some things in 90 days. And sometimes you may have team members that rotate off and then you have the next group of subject matter experts come in. Um, that is one of the things that has helped us culture-wise, not just engage more team members, but to help the folks that we are engaging feel like, um, you know, there are goals, we're going to accomplish some things, and there's an endpoint to this particular work so that you don't feel like you're just trapped in this um, work group or project that won't ever end, but isn't going anywhere either, right? So that, that has been one of the significant things that we have, and we feel like you know, a lot of team members have been satisfied with that experience. Okay. Uh, last couple seconds here, but uh, Travis, a number of people are asking uh, the same thing in a different way here, which is, uh, can you share the uh, mapping tool? Um, how can we learn more about it? Um, how can we engage more? Could you answer that one? Yeah. And I think, you know, when we send out these materials, there'll be a reference to our website with our contact information. You can see the templates very straightforward, but I'd be happy to share um, ways that Jan, Tammy, and I facilitate some of this work because the facilitation is where some of the dialogue has to happen. So it's not just enough to have the template. I do think there's some art around facilitating groups to make sure you can get the maps populated. So I'll be happy to share some of that um, after today's webinar. Well, fantastic. Well, well, Juan, Travis, thank you for such an outstanding presentation today. I, I truly learned a great deal. I loved it. It was, uh, it's, and it's going to be posted to our website next week for everybody's uh, uh, noting there. Uh, go to the last slide here, and we'll talk a little bit about the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. We have 400 training and professional development certification courses, and four which relate directly to today's topic. HR management, culture engagement and leadership, quality management basics, leading high performance teams, and measuring sustainable management performance. All four of those are certification courses. And you can visit our website at baldrigeinstitute.org education to learn more and to register. 
Uh, lastly, as a reminder, a recorded version of today's presentation and slides will be made available on the Foundation's website next week. And once again, thanks to all of our great sponsors and donors who make presentations like today possible. We hope to see you again next month, on February 22nd, when Michael Kramer of Managed Hub will present Accelerating Baldridge, Four Essential Tools That Help Drive Rapid Results. Thanks again for attending this afternoon and enjoy the remainder of your day.